This is the Music Halls of Fame podcast. This week, we honor the year in music for 2013, along with a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame class of 2013. We also make the case for putting Oasis into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, plus our Spotlight Hall of Fame is the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum in Nashville, Tennessee. Before we get going with the podcast, like everyone tells you, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you'll know when these podcast episodes drop, which is usually every Thursday. Now, on to this week's episode. The year was 2013. In music for 2013, Beyoncé reunited with the rest of Destiny's Child during her halftime performance at the Super Bowl, and then on December 13th, she surprise-dropped her album Beyoncé, starting a trend of big-named artists surprise-dropping albums. Lord debuted in 2013 with her album Pure Heroin as well. Some of the biggest albums of the year were Daft Punk's Random Access Memories, Rihanna's Unapologetic, Mumford & Sons' Babel, Pink's The Truth About Love, Eminem's The Marshall Mathers LP2, Katy Perry's Prism, Lady Gaga's Art Pop, Lords's aforementioned album Pure Heroin, Bruno Mars's Unorthodox Jukebox, Florida Georgia Line's Here's to Good Times, One Direction's Take Me Home, Drake's is Nothing Was the Same, Beyonce's aforementioned album, Blake Shelton's Based on a True Story, Luke Bryan's Crash My Party, Imagine Dragon's Night Visions, Tyler the Creator's Wolf, Jay-Z's Magna Carta, Holy Grail, Justin Timberlake's The 2020 Experience, 21 Pilots' Vessel, and Chance the Rapper's Acid Rap. The soundtrack to the movie Frozen came out late in 2013, but got mega popular in 2014. Singles-wise, 2013 was the year of Daft Punk, who ruled the charts with their smash hit Get Lucky. Robin Thicke became huge with his song Blurred Lines and then was sued and lost the lawsuit in 2015 to Marvin Gaye's estate when the estate said that Blurred Lines was a little too close to Marvin's 1970s classic song Got to Give It Up. Other hits from 2013 included Miley Cyrus's Wrecking Ball, Katy Perry's Roar, Lords's Royals, Avicii's Wake Me Up, Macklemore's Can't Hold Us, along with his hit song Thrift Shop, and Drake's Started From The Bottom Now Here, along with the novelty song What Does The Fox Say from the duo Elvis. In country music, 2013 marked the year that Taylor Swift ended her country era with her album Red. Her next album, 1989, would take her music style from country into the pop realm. Country was still strong, though, as artists like Blake Shelton, Florida Georgia Line, Luke Bryan, Jason Aldean, Little Big Town, Eric Church, Lady Antebellum, now known, of course, as Lady A., Hunter Hayes, Darius Rucker, the band Perry, and Tim McGraw had really good years. In hip-hop, Macklemore and Ryan Lewis were the big artists with songs Thrift Shop and Can't Hold Us. Kendrick Lamar, Lil Wayne, Drake, Jay-Z, Pitbull, Eminem, Whale, and J. Cole also had huge songs. The biggest albums of the year were released by Eminem, Jay-Z, Kanye, Drake, J. Cole, Lil Wayne, Whale, Kid Cudi, ASAP Rocky, and Mac Miller. In dance music, EDM was in full swing, in the mainstream at least, with EDM artists regularly cracking the top pop and dance charts to go along with the usual pop and R&B artists who were normally found on those dance charts. 2013 was the year that Bauer broke through with the hit Harlem Shake thanks to that viral video trend that was surrounding that song. At the age of 17, Martin Garrix came onto the scene with his song, Animals. Avicii's Wake Me Up moved him into the mainstream and onto the top 10 on the pop charts, along with Daft Punk's Get Lucky. Other dance albums of the year that came from EDM artists included Emily Sands' Next to Me, Fatboy Slim's Eat, Sleep, Rave, Repeat, Dimitri Vegas and Like Mike's Mammoth, 
Alesso and One Republics, If I Lose Myself, Dubs, and Bourget's Tsunami. Showtex Booyah, Oliver Heldon's Gecko, Tegan and Sarah's Closer, Vessie's We Are Young, Tiesto's Red Lights, Cedric Gervais's remix of Lana Del Rey's ballad, Summertime Sadness, which became a huge hit. Zed's Clarity, also a huge hit. David Guetta's Work Hard, Swedish House Mafia's Don't You Worry Child, which cracked the top 10 on the pop charts, and Icona Pops's I Love It. 2013 was also the year of the Superstar Stadium DJ, as the top 10 DJs on DJ Mag's Top 100 DJs poll were Hardwell, Armin Van Buren, Avicii, Tiesto, David Guetta, Dimitri Vegas, and Like Mike, Nicky Romero, Steve Aoki, Afrojack, and Dash Berlin. In Latin music, the big artists for the year were Jenny Rivera, Mark Anthony, Romeo Santos, Don Omar, Prince Royce, Alejandro Fernandez, Mana, Alejandro Sanz, and Daddy Yankee. Musicals and revivals of musicals that were popular in 2013 included Kinky Boots, Pippin, King Kong, American Psycho, The Commitment, Motown the Musical, A Night with Janis Joplin, Honeymoon in Vegas, From Here to Eternity, Beautiful the Carol King Musical, The Bridges of Madison County, and Here Lies Love. And if you guess that Broadway was hell-bent on turning movies into Broadway musicals that year, you would be correct. I didn't say that it was a good trend, just that it was that trend that year. In any event, musical films that came out in 2013 included The Sapphires, Inside Llewellyn Davis, Begin Again, Black Nativity, along with the animated films Frozen, which came out late in the year and became huge in 2014. Bands that formed in 2013 included BTS, The Brothers Osborne, GRL, Pup, and Run the Jewels. Stone Temple Pilots lead singer Scott Whelan was fired from the band and was replaced for a while by Chester Bennington of Linkin Park. Bands that either broke up until, of course, their inevitable reunions or announced their hiatus in 2013 included A Tribe Called Quest, The Bloodhound Gang, Evanescence, Lifehouse, Mumford and Sons, My Chemical Romance, Climax, The Swedish House Mafia, Naughty by Nature, Girls Aloud, The Jonas Brothers, and Prince and the New Power Generation. At least half of those groups got back together in some way, shape, or form within a decade. In fact, the Postal Service ended up breaking up and reforming again in 2013. Bands that also reformed in 2013, other than the Postal Service, included All Saints, Danity Kane, Black Flag, The Calling, Jurassic 5, Fall Out Boy, King Crimson, Nine Inch Nails, Rocket from the Crypt, The Violent Femmes, and TLC. Artists who unfortunately passed away in 2013 included singer Patti Page, singer Patti Andrews of the Andrews Sisters, Ray Manzarek of The Doors, entertainer Annette Funicello, Chrissy Amphlett of The Divinals, Joey Covington of Jefferson Airplane, country music singer Mindy McCready, singer Tony Sheridan, pianist Van Cliburn, rapper Lil Snoop, guitarist Alvin Lee of Ten Years After, Alan Myers of Devo, Corey Monteith of Glee, drummer Clive Burr of Iron Maiden, pianist Don Shirley, folk singer Richie Havens, country music singer George Jones, blues singer Bobby Blue Bland, singer J.J. Kale, Chris Kelly of Criss Cross, Pete Haycock of the Climax Blues Band, keyboardist George M. Duke, singer Edie Gourmet of the duo Steve and Edie, Philip Chevron of the Pogues, Jan Kulamand of Vixen, Jeff Hanneman of Slayer, jazz pianist Cedar Walton Jr., Lou Reed of the Velvet Underground and, of course, solo music fame, Walk on the Wild Side, jazz drummer and band leader Chico Hamilton, and singer-songwriter Ray Price. For the awards for the music of 2013 at the Grammy Awards, Daft Punk became the first EDM act to win Album of the Year for Random Access Memories. Get Lucky won the French duo Record of the Year. 
Song of the Year went to Lords is Royals, and 2013 was the year that Macklemore and Ryan Lewis beat out Kendrick Lamar for Best New Artist. An extremely controversial decision, to be nice about it. At the MTV Video Music Awards, Justin Timberlake's Mirrors won Video of the Year. That was also the ceremony where Miley Cyrus twerked in front of Robin Thicke during his performance of his song Blurred Lines, which made everybody think that white people actually invented twerking when it's been around for decades, basically centuries. (sighs) Boy, oh boy. Anyway... At the American Music Awards, Taylor Swift, Ariana Grande, and Florida Georgia Line were the big winners. At the Billboard Music Awards, Justin Timberlake, Miley Cyrus, Lord, and Robin Thicke were the big winners. Kendrick Lamar won Album of the Year at the Soul Train Music Awards. Justin Timberlake's 2020 Experience won Favorite Album, and Katy Perry's Roar won Favorite Song at the People's Choice Awards that year. George Strait won Entertainer of the Year at the Country Music Association Awards, and Miranda Lambert and Luke Bryan were the big winners at the Academy of Country Music Awards. Arctic Monkeys won Best British Album for AM and Rudimental, and Ella Airy won Best Song for Waiting All Night at the Brit Awards. Serena Ryder won Artist of the Year, while Arcade Fire won Album of the Year for Reflector, and Tegan and Sarah won Song of the Year for Closer at the Juno Awards. Tame Impala won Album of the Year for Lonerism, and Matt Corby won Song of the Year for Resolution at the Aria Music Awards. At the Eurovision Singing Contest, which was held that year in Malmo, Sweden, Denmark won that year for the song Only Teardrops. At the Tony Awards, Kinky Boots won Best Musical, and Pippin won Best Revival of a Musical. For Academy Award Music Categories, the soundtrack to Frozen won Best Film Score, and Let It Go from Frozen won Best Song. Carolyn Shaw won the Pulitzer Prize that year for music for Partita for Eight Voices, and James Blake won the Mercury Music Prize for his album Overgrown. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony took place on April 18, 2013 at the Nokia Theater in Los Angeles, California. It was the first year that Los Angeles hosted the event since 1993. It was also the first year that the fans were able to vote on who would get in. That vote, which only counted for one of 500 votes for the hall, was won by the group Rush. The Hall inducted record producer and executive Lou Adler and producer and songwriter Quincy Jones into the non-performers category. And in the performers category, the Hall inducted Heart, Public Enemy, Albert King, Donna Summer, Rush, and this next artist. Randy Newman was born November 28, 1943 in Los Angeles, California. Three of his uncles, Alfred, Lionel, and Emil, were film composers. Randy also has four cousins who are film composers, Maria, Joey, David, and Thomas. And with that many composers in his family, it is absolutely no wonder that he became a songwriter and film composer himself. He started writing songs for other artists when he was 17 years old. He wrote songs specifically for Jackie DeShannon, Gene Pitney, Harper's Bazaar, The OJs, Petula Clark, Dusty Springfield, Pat Boone, and many more. As a performer, he started when he was 18, although he didn't put out a debut album until 1968. In the early 1970s, he started earning a reputation as a great songwriter. Many artists started doing cover versions of his songs. Those artists included Bette Midler, Helen Reddy, Judy Collins, Art Garfunkel, the Everly Brothers, and more. Harry Nilsson did an album of Newman covers. Three Dog Night turned a cover version of Randy's song Mama Told Me Not to Come into a huge hit. You Can Leave Your Hat On became a hit for Joe Cocker when it was included into the movie Nine and a Half Weeks. In 1977, Randy got his first major hit of his own with the song Short People. The song was actually a snarky joke. 
but people were completely bent out of shape about it, which probably helped it get to number nine on the Billboard charts. In 1983, Randy put out the album Trouble in Paradise, which had the song that became the unofficial song of Los Angeles, I Love L.A., while the song itself only made it to number 110 on Billboard singles chart, the music video for the song became popular and the song ended up being used in a number of commercials, some associated with team sports and other businesses in Los Angeles, and some which had absolutely nothing to do with L.A., but tweaked the lyrics enough to still use the music, especially using the song lyric, We Love It. While he was writing pop hits for other artists and putting out his own records, Randy was also doing film and TV scores. He started mainly in television, doing songs and scores for shows like Peyton Place, The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis, and Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. His film scores included Cold Turkey, Ragtime, and Three Amigos. Pixar came calling for his services from the very beginning of their existence back in the 1990s. Randy actually started with Pixar's first film, Toy Story. To date, he's done nine Pixar movies, all four Toy Stories, A Bug's Life, Monsters, Inc., The Cars Trilogy, and Monsters University. His song, You've Got a Friend in Me, from Toy Story, is probably his most recognizable film song. He's also written film scores for Disney's The Princess and the Frog, Parenthood, The Natural, James and the Giant Peach, Meet the Parents, Sea Biscuit, Awakenings, and more. Randy's induction was slightly controversial due to the fact that he was known more as a songwriter and film composer rather than for his rock or pop music records. However, it was all of the songs that he originally did that ended up becoming hits for other people combined with his influential songwriting that actually got him into the hall. Randy Newman released 11 studio albums. Of those, three hit the top 40, with 1977's Little Criminals hitting number 9. Randy also released 28 movie soundtracks. Of those, only two hit the top 40, with 2006's Cars soundtrack hitting number 6. 2001's Monsters Incorporated hit number 25. As far as singles went, only 1977's Short People hit the top 40, but it went all the way up to number 2. Even though 2010's You've Got a Friend in Me from Toy Story never hit the top 100, it is actually his biggest selling song of his career, and was his only song that he performed on that actually went platinum. Out of the songs that he wrote for other people, two of them hit the top 40. Three Dog Nights' 1970 hit Mama Told Me Not to Come hit number one, while Joe Cocker's 1986 hit You Can Leave Your Hat On hit number 35. Presented for induction by Don Henley of 1998 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees The Eagles, Mr. Randy Newman, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2013, and we have put a selection of his music on to this week's podcast music playlist, the link to which is in the show notes. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you that there is now a Music History In-Depth podcast where we go more in-depth on a few of the events that happened in music history for that particular week. The Music History In-Depth podcast drops every Tuesday on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast from, as does our Music History Today podcast, which goes over the daily events in music history. The Music History Today podcast drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. <music> Since they're back in the news with all the hype surrounding their reunion, we're going to revisit the case for Manchester, England's dysfunctional sibling group Oasis to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. As we always do, to the tale of the tape we go. Oasis released seven studio albums, two live albums, five compilation albums, and one EP. Of those, six hit the top 40 in America, with three of those six going top ten. In the UK, things were completely different. 
14 of their albums went top 40, with 12 of the 14 going top 10, with 8 of those 12 actually going to number 1. Those albums being 2010's Greatest Hits album, Time Flies, and every single one of their studio albums. Oasis also released 30 singles. Of those, only 1995's Wonderwall hit the top 40 in America, topping out at number 8. In the UK, again, completely different story. 26 of their songs hit the top 40, with 21 of those 26 going top 10, including 8 of those 21 going to number 1. Worldwide, Oasis's album sold over 80 million copies, with all of their studio albums either going platinum or multi-platinum. They were nominated for three Grammy Awards in America, winning none of them. In Britain, though, they were award kings. They were nominated for 17 Brit Awards, winning six of those. And worldwide, they received 90 award nominations, winning exactly half of those. For those of you not good at math, that would be 45. While grunge ruled American music, Oasis ruled Britannia. The group was one of the most influential groups coming out of England, and they still, to this very day, influence groups such as the Arctic Monkeys, for instance. And while the Gallagher brothers might not have gotten along all too well, just to be nice about it, they sure did put out some great music with albums such as Definitely Maybe, What's the Story, Morning Glory, and Be Here Now, along with songs like Wonderwall, Live Forever, Cigarettes and Alcohol, Supersonic, Rock and Roll Star, and Don't Look Back in Anger. In fact, Oasis's place in music history is pretty much solidified. The only knock against Oasis not being inducted after all this time that I can see at least is that they did not sell as well in America as they did in the rest of the world, which shouldn't be a knock at them at all. And while Wonderwall is now a staple at EDM festivals and DJ sets to get the crowd singing before they completely destroy the song in some freaking crappy EDM remix, looking at you, every single one of you EDM DJs out there. But I digress. Wonderwall was one of the group's few songs to ever make the pop charts in America. The band did much better on the Billboard American alternative music charts and also the British charts, where most of their songs were top five staples. Regardless, the band was on the shortlist for induction this past year, but came up short. I do hope that the Hall will put them into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, hopefully this next season, because they certainly deserve to be. I just don't think that the band will show up to accept the award, even with the Brothers Gallagher reuniting. Because knowing that sibling rivalry, I'm not even quite sure they're going to make it to their reunion concerts in England next year. Just saying. This week's Spotlight Hall of Fame is the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum. The Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum is located at 222 Representative John Lewis Way South in Nashville, Tennessee. The Country Music Hall of Fame Museum was opened on April 1, 1967, but they started inducting members into the hall in 1961. The first members were Jimmy Rogers, Frank Rose, and Hank Williams Sr., the museum has almost 200,000 recordings and an extensive collection of memorabilia, both in the museum itself and in their digital archives on their website at countrymusichalloffame.org. The museum is one of Nashville's biggest attractions and is open daily, normally from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Ticket prices at last check were $25.95 for adults and $15.95 for kids 6 through 12. Museum members and kids under 6 are admitted free. However, they still need to get tickets. Go to countrymusichalloffame.org for more information and updated prices and hours and also to reserve your tickets. We will, of course, put the link in the show notes. 
Charlie Pride was born on March 18, 1934, in Sledge, Mississippi, to former sharecroppers. When he was younger, he developed great pitching skills and decided that he wanted to follow in the footsteps of his brother, Mac Pride Jr., and become a baseball player. He started out playing in the Negro Leagues and even made it into the New York Yankees minor league farm system before an injury affected his pitching. From there, Charlie ended up playing minor league baseball in the Midwest, especially Wisconsin. During one brief team stint, both he and another player were actually traded to another team for a tour bus. Literally, they got traded for a tour bus. Aside from being traded for a tour bus, Charlie was actually beginning to make headway with baseball until Uncle Sam and the draft came calling. He did two years in the United States Army from 1956 to 1958 and then went back to playing baseball. Charlie played for a while for a team in Helena, Montana called the East Helena Smelterites. While he played for the team, he also worked at the local smelting plant. Someone overheard Charlie singing one day and suggested that he sing to warm up the crowd before games. In those days, he got paid $10 per game and $10 per singing gig before the game, so it was pretty easy to say yes to that. And soon, he was also singing all around the Midwest. Charlie decided to make music his sole focus, so he went around playing gigs and shopping around a demo tape. One demo tape made its way to country music legend Chet Atkins. Chet started out singing in the 1940s and 50s with hit after hit to show for it. And after some time, he also became a record producer and executive for RCA Nashville. Chet is one of the originators of what became known as the Nashville Sound, which took the fiddle and steel guitar out of country music, thereby making country music more accessible to mainstream America. Chet heard Charlie's demo tape and got Charlie a recording contract with RCA Nashville. Charlie's third single, Just Between You and Me, became his first big hit and even got him a Grammy Award nomination. That started what became an amazing run on the Billboard Country Music Charts. In the first five years of his singing career, Charlie had eight number one country singles with songs like It's Just Me, Kiss an Angel Good Morning, I'd Rather Love You, and many more. In total, Charlie had 29 number one country hits out of 52 top 10 country hits. In 1969, he put out his first Greatest Hits album, and even that sold over a million copies and went to number one on the country charts. Over the next three decades, Charlie released 44 studio albums and sold over 70 million albums, which made him second on RCA's biggest-selling artist list, right behind the great one, Mr. Elvis Presley. Out of his studio albums, nine of them, along with two of his greatest hits albums, went to number one on the country charts. He was the second African-American artist to perform at the Grand Ole Opry, was one of its three African-American members currently, along with harmonica player DeFord Bailey, who was the first one, and Darius Rucker, who is now a solo country music star after years fronting the band Hootie and the Blowfish, although he reunited with Hootie in the past few years to go on tour. Charlie also became an entrepreneur, becoming, among many other things, part owner of the Texas Rangers baseball team, circling it all back to the beginning. In 2020, Charlie Pride became a victim of the COVID-19 pandemic and passed away on December 12, 2020, at the age of 86 years old. Charlie won four Grammy Awards, including a Lifetime Achievement Award, although only one of his wins was actually in the country music category. Two of his wins were in the gospel music categories. He won the Country Music Association Entertainer of the Year Award and twice won Male Vocalist of the Year. He won three American Music Awards in the country music categories in the mid-1970s. All of this while being an African American in a genre that has been, well, let's just say less than polite when it comes to African Americans. 
Charlie Pride inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame in Nashville, Tennessee in the year 2000. The Music Halls of Fame podcast is part of the Music History Today network, which can be found under Music History Today on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts from, and also on our YouTube page under Music History Today. Thank you very much for listening.